is a radical reform. We aspire to political status, and I will continue to believe until I die that before Malta achieves certain responsibility, she cannot make any progress. It is useless for the Maltese to criticize each other. It is useless because until this state status is attained, we will be unable to have what we desire. He consistently preached that, uh, even to his own party, that the main opponent was not the Labour Party. Our opponents, he used to say, is colonialism. Once we get rid of that, then we can start making progress. Ganado, who uh, did not see eye to eye with him during this period, particularly, uh, actually quotes him as saying, even if I remain on my own, I will continue to fight for Moltes independence. And that is within the party. Now, he was one of those people that, if he gets an idea into his head, and he's convinced about it, no one was going to, uh, you know, convince him to forget about it. He set apart, he continued. He was a gentleman, but a very suspicious and superstitious gentleman. Uh, he had really abhorred colonialism, but he, and he continually stood up for Maltese these rights. Some time ago, and I published about this uh, two years ago, I came across documents which I had never seen before in my life, and apparently nobody else had, about the personal fight he had with the British in connection with the national anthem. He did it on the quiet, nobody knew about it, but it was a, a battle which took 15 years. It wasn't just a win. Uh, he had on the downside the fact that if there was a real problem in front of him, he very often took too long to come to a conclusion. Uh, he, he seemed averse to taking the chance that it might be uh, a solution which might have adverse effects afterwards. Uh, and this, of course, played into his, the hands of his political opponents, especially Mintoff. Uh, Mintoff built a picture of him, especially in the 60s, uh, as the person uh, in Maltese, it sounds much better, the Iglesi in the Kurdish level, that's it, Nash. He's always asleep. Right? But this is, was completely inaccurate. He wanted independence to be accompanied by mutual defense agreement, under which, sorry, under which Malta would make defense facilities available to the UK. The financial agreement would specify the UK's financial contribution to Malta's economic development. He also sought membership of the Commonwealth and relations with NATO. And he didn't move from that. That was his agenda. He followed it and he achieved it. Now Mintoff, after the failure to integrate Malta with the UK, Mintoff threw his energy behind the achievement of independence. He envisaged Malta as a neutral republic that would negotiate the most beneficiary agreement with whoever offered the best terms. As for membership of the Commonwealth, Malta would decide following independence. Mintoff was a complex mixture of restlessness, self-belief, tenacity, a compulsion to control, catchiness when gay said, and political acumen streaked with ruthlessness. He evoked admiration and respect, sometimes tinged with bitterness from comrades in arms, and loathing and resentment, sometimes shaped by grudging admiration from political opponents. I think that sums the man uh, pretty much. Uh, one major handicap that Mintoff had was he had, he had completely earned uh, HM, Her Majesty's government's distrust. Uh, the, the way he conducted the, the integration negotiations, uh, if you see some of the comments after, after meetings with him, private comments by, by some of the officials, you know, some of them were erasing. Um, after the he moved the break of bitter resolution in December 1957. That was the last straw for the British. And the extra last straw were the April 28 uh, riots. Now that was Mintoff's, uh, and I say Mintoff's not the Labour Party because he was responsible for that. He organized them. That was Mintoff's greatest political mistake. From that moment onwards, the British didn't want to know. And in fact, we find him in the very 
uh, demeaning situation in which he is trying to get back into a negotiating position with, with the British government. There is one episode which uh, I published in Volume 3, not in this present book, Volume, in which he goes to the Lieutenant Governor, Trafford Smith, talks about this and that, and then uh, broaches the subject he has in mind. And he, he tells the he tells the Lieutenant Governor, if the British government agrees to early elections in Malta, because they were still on the cards at that stage, and Minto uh, for sure he would win the election if there was an election, he said, the Labour Party, I haven't told my colleagues yet, but I'm sure they'll come around to it, uh, the Labour Party will be prepared to uh, engage with the British government before publishing its puppets electoral manifesto. And that was the lowest point to which he was forced to sink in his attempt to get back into a position where the British government would uh, actually talk to him. In 1959, Mintoff said that the church saw the continuation of the political status quo as in the best interests, in its best interest, initiated a non campaign to discredit Gonzi and the clergy in an attempt to undermine their influence. Uh, the way I'm putting it there is that he initiated that quarrel. I'm saying this because he himself admitted it to me in one of my interviews with him. When I asked him the specific question, I said, all the evidence shows that, uh, I think it was around about March 1959, uh, that this is from this point that you really start a strong campaign against the church. He said, yes. You're right. And he, and he explained, he said, at that point, it was clear they were not going to get an early election, so I could take on the British government. It is also clear that the church would side with the British, so it was time to attempt to make it lose its political influence. The church was elected by attending the MLP Executive Council and declaring membership of the MLP contributing to the MLP press, printing, reading or selling its newspapers and all that's in. MLP members were denied sacraments and buried in unconsecrated ground. <coughs> now Gonzi. Gonzi felt keenly his responsibility for the spiritual welfare of the office block. You know, again, now the theory is that the whole political and religious struggle was two strong characters who couldn't get on with each other. Uh, that wasn't it. There were principles involved on both sides. As far as Gonzo was concerned, his responsibility was to try and protect his flock from pernicious influences, including uh, Mintoff and his, uh, his socialist ideas. And he was prepared to go the whole length to do that. Uh, Mintoff was absolutely certain that unless the church lost its influence, he could not put his political uh, ideas into practice. That was the problem. Uh, Gonzi would fight anybody who stood in his way, obviously including including uh, and during the 1962 election campaign, the church stopped just short of formally declaring that voting for the MLP was a mortal sin. It never declared that, though it conveyed the impression quite clearly. And it never declared that because it was warned by the British not to do that. The governor himself warned Gonzi in a private interview in which he told him that the consequences uh, could be that the election would have to be suspended. So he stopped that. The only place where that message could get through was in Gonzo, where in spite of Gonzi trying to convince Monsignor Pache to do the same thing, Monsignor Pache ignored him. Following the election, confessors were instructed to withhold absolution to MLP voters unless they genuinely repented and promised to support the party in the future. Now, an example of the bad advice that very often got involved was... Hmm, sorry. <laughs> the tomatoes are over there. <laughs> um, one, one example of the bad example uh, Gonzi very often got. Uh, without, I think, much doubt, was, for example, when confessors were given that, those instructions, the circular was, uh, to them, was published in Latin. 
Because that, that way nobody would understand this. <laughs> the following week it had been translated and it was doing the rounds. So, you know, the idea boggles the mind. And by keeping away from them, 
he, he managed to outwit them. General election result, PM 25 seats, which within a few months became 20 seats when a member of the uh, Parti Democratico Nacionalista crossed the floor. The Malta Labour Party 16, Parti Cardomanza are four seats, the PCP one seat, and the Christian Democratic Party, uh, which was not an all starter actually, no seats at all. So, a contrasting interpre interpretation of what the election result meant. The PN claimed it had been given a mandate for independence. And, to be fair, every time uh, Borch Olivier or senior members of the party addressed a public meeting, and there were plenty of them, during the election campaign, the theme of independence was hammered in. There was no way you could say that they were not advocating independence if they won. The MLP strongly denounced the election as profoundly unfair, but agreed that the majority was clearly in favour of independence. They demanded new elections before independence, and this remained constant uh, up to independence. They wanted new elections before independence. Mintov did not believe that Borch Olivier would actually do anything about independence. He believed that uh, we would go through the motions but would not actually do anything concrete together. The behavior and pronouncements of the church and of the junta, Tadeo at St. John's, Alama and Aurbana, uh, reinforced his interpretation that the result was simply defense of the church. In independence had nothing to do with it. There they are, uh, after the Tadeo in procession, Alama and Aurbana. The three centre parties insisted that the people had voted to defend the church by keeping the MLP out of office, not for independence. Parti Hadamansar and Parti Democratic Nationalista opposed independence until Malta was economically viable. <coughs> but the Parti Hadamansar changed the stance later on. Uh, it went for a version of a watered down integration. The PCP were against independence under any circumstances. The message services Rwanda announced in February 1962 came as a severe shock. Unemployment was projected to reach 20,000 if industry and tourism took off and if emigration averaged 10,000 a year. Now, these were the results of two different studies a joint Maltese government, British government uh, study, and also the uh, result of the study carried out by the Stalker UN mission. Such predictions make the prospect of independence seem more intimidating to most people. Yet following the election, Bolshevik's position as a big was reversed. Now this was a very important change. The church, for all its claims of victory, was shocked by the end of these 51,000 Sulla Talatsa, soldiers of steel. And this really shocked the church. It realized that it had miscalculated, and miscalculated badly. When Mintov came out with his uh, slogan, 51 uh, soldiers of steel, it, it wasn't just a, it, it wasn't simply, uh, you know, it was one of his propaganda uh, bits. He knew he had a solid base on which to build. And we see him doing that in the following years. The way he organizes the party, the way he organizes the uh, the media, the party's media, uh, it, it comes all together and he ends up, he ends up with a much stronger party than he, sta he started with in 1962. The tables now were turned. Gonzi now needed the board of to remain Prime Minister, for if he resigned, he would open the way to his replacement by Mentoff. Uh, at this stage, Borchard wasn't even saying, I'm going to be Prime Minister. He wanted constitutional changes. Unless I get them, the Australian government, including the British, I'll resign. Gonzi uh, was terrified that he would do that. And in fact, he kept, kept pressing the British, make sure you listen to what he's saying. Whatever his personal beliefs regarding what sort of his abilities, Gonzi had no alternative but to tread carefully. 
a shrewd politician Paul Trinidad understood the danger of Gonzi's opposition to independence, but also his indispensability to Gonzi. Likewise, he was equally aware that HMG had no wish to see Minto leading a neutral junta. Consequently, he made full use of both cards. The, what I call the Mintoff again. From this on, you see him using the Mintoff factor, you know, the theory of Mintoff, both with the church and with Her Majesty's government. On 28 August 1962, Borja Rivera wrote to Sands, on behalf of the government and the people of the island of Malta and its dependencies, I have the honor to invoke for my country the right to be an independent state. I request you therefore to fix as a matter of urgency a date for Maltese Islands independence with the Commonwealth. Now look at Sands reply. I shall be pleased to arrange a meeting between our two governments as soon as practicable to consider your proposal. Now that has been misinterpreted into saying yes. We grant you independence. Sands isn't saying that. We will need to discuss the proposal. And in fact, when Portugal himself writes a letter later on and says, when you agree to independence, the governor said, oh, we did not agree to independence. The main stumbling blocks that Portugal had to overcome in negotiating independence were the prerogatives to be enjoyed by the Church, Her Majesty's government's new reluctance to grant Malta independence, I'll speak about this later, the defence agreement and the financial agreement. The North Party Malta Independence Conference was held in London in August 1963. It was chaired by the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Duncan Sands. The parties arrived with their uh, particular agendas. The Centre Party to spoil the conference, the Nationalist Party to get endorsement of its draft constitution, the Malta Labour Party to have the numerous amendments included. Prior to the Independence Conference, Bishop Gallia had summarized six negotiating points put forward in Rome by Mintov as follows. And these really went around the world and really had an effect. This is Putin, Mintov. Now, to be fair, because I think we have to try and make an effort to be, a, to be objective, these weren't six points cast in stone by any stretch of the imagination. These were six ideas jotted down by Mentor as a preliminary in case negotiations started in Rome and they would be the base for discussion. That's all they were. They were. Separation between church and state, the state would be secular and should treat all religions equally, recognition of civil marriage, privilege of foreign to be limited, censorship of films and books to be the government's exclusive responsibility, violence to be admissible in certain cases. Uh, that last one, particularly, uh, a lot of that was made about it. He was thinking in terms of what happened, had happened uh, in 1958. Not, uh, you see, Mintov bluffed a lot. He used bluff as one of his principal weapons. And as we shall see later, one of his great bluffs during uh, this period is that unless everybody agreed to what he was saying, then there would be chaos and mood. But he wasn't very careful how he phrased himself, as I shall show later on. The church issue. The church had pressed Garanto to include constitutional provisions that would guarantee the position of, re of, the re of religion and the church. Mitov insisted on the introduction of Corrupt Practices, Practices Act on the British law. He wanted a change in the electoral law so that it would be impossible for the church to impose moral sanctions. Full stop. That was it. Borchon Revere donned the role of primary defender of the church by going well beyond what the church expected. His strategy here is 
as I did during the election campaign, I will replace the centre parties as the chief defender of the church. And to everyone's surprise, including the church, Portugal again went one better by proposing that insofar as the chapter of fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual were concerned, he put in two amendments. Nothing done by the Roman Catholic Church in the exercise of his spiritual powers or duties shall be held to be in contravention of any of the provisions of this chapter. Nothing contained in or done under the authority of any law for the protection of the religion in water shall be held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of any of the provisions of this chapter. In other words, as far as human rights were concerned, the church was going to be above the law. Now, this was very unbourgeois-revere. Why did he put it in? He wanted to show that he was the best protector for the church, but, as I shall show later on, his real, his real uh, intention was he wanted a bargaining chip. And we shall see him using it later on. Or try to. Since Portugal was not to be secular reminded, there these two sub clauses took everyone by surprise, including the church. Thoroughly angered Minchev and sat seriously worried HMG. No one realized that Portugal intended to use them as a bargaining chip. Please. The other failure of the Independence Conference and subsequent talks between Borchardville and Sands left Minto Thurmbach on the local, led Minto Thurmbach on the local and international stage. He conducted a series of meetings at which he made threatening statements in a bid to push the government into meeting his demands. One example, this was at St. Paul's Bay. Unless we have human rights, we will not accept any government in Malta. We will fight for our rights in the streets and everywhere else. And when we fight, there will be no commandos involved. Notice that first part of that statement, the first part of that statement. Unless we have human rights. Those were going to be included in the Constitution. So what he was in fact saying, we will not be doing any of this if we have human rights. But it sounded very threatening. And he keeps repeating this kind of thing all the time. So you better listen to me, make me part of the whole process, or you're going, there's going to be trouble. This was taken extremely seriously, especially by the British. The British, of course, had me out within the Malta Labour Party Executive Council. And everything was reported the next morning, after each, in great detail, after each meeting. And they would try to piece this little, these little things together and build, build a picture. And in fact, uh, we find Dorman being very, very worried that Minto was actually uh, preparing a coup d'etat in Malta. And he, and he uh, stages a meeting of the, of the, executive, of the executive council in order to, to make preparations for this. Uh, well, uh, should we make arrangements for the cabinet to start meeting some place like Slima, where it isn't so pro-Labour, uh, if, if there's this danger, there was never any danger of this. Uh, I took me to the task on this, very, very strong, I had a very long debate on this, and I remember. Is that one stage is that, a little bit of light, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, when you also fooled by, by this, because I was present, it was very, very hard on, the, on this kind of thing. Right. Uh, it has been reported that um, the cabinet actually went to Tarja Gap to uh, to case the joint so that they could have a meeting there if there was a coup d'etat. This is not true. Portugal never believed it to start with. Uh, the cabinet did have a cabinet meeting at Tarja Gap just in case there was going to be a war. But that was three years later, in 1967, during the Six Days War. I found no answer. On the international front, Mintoff and uh, 
with the allegation visited the Soviet embassy in London, Minto visited Egypt's Nasser and Algeria and was reported to have been promised help. During the independence referendum campaign, the MLP brought us from Cairo. Minto also led the delegation to the Soviet Union. He used the MLP's membership of the Socialist International to instigate a debate about Malta by the Committee of 70 at the United Nations. It was, it was building this great picture of all these uh, countries and leaders who were ready to step in as soon as he blew the whistle. Again, most of that was bluff. His utterances and meetings with anti his utterances and meetings with anti-West leaders <coughs> with anti-West leaders alarmed the church and her majesty's government, but in advertently strengthened both with his head. Bolshevik shrewdly used the anxiety generated to his advantage by adopting the line that if he failed to fulfill his agenda, he would resign, leaving the way open to him to assume power. He even at one stage told them, very plainly, you will force my hand if you want me to come to terms with Mintov, be it on your hands. The British believe it. And the past developed as none oh. And the past developed as none of the parties would budge from the position. The centre parties demanded a referendum on the question of independence. What shall we get say? No, no need for a referendum. They are decided in 1962. No need for a referendum. Then the other people wanted fresh elections. Then what should they get to the referendum? But not the way they wanted it. They wanted a referendum. Do you want independence? The referendum said, do you approve Malta's constitution as approved by the Legislative Assembly or the House of Representatives? Right? Which the government trumpeted as a Catholic constitution. There you have it. Votiva fissermata cattolica libera. That was the line Bolshevik and his party took. Gomzi was put under immense pressure to come out in favor of a yes vote. He resisted that, he didn't want independence. Uh, but he could not afford to give the word that the people should vote no. Because what would happen there? What would they go? The centre parties were left helpless since the church washed its hands of the matter. The MLP were pushed into advocating a no vote that in itself held the PN's argument that the constitution was a Catholic one. If the MLP are saying no, and the MLP are fighting the church, so they don't want a, a constitution which protects the church. How is that for an argument? It worked. However, no one was aware of the hidden hand of Her Majesty's government. See, things had changed in Britain. After Sands had convinced the British government that since Malta's role was not as important as it was, they could probably afford the dependence for Malta if there was a satisfactory defence agreement. By the beginning of 1963, the geopolitical picture had changed. They were having trouble in Libya. The Libyan government, under pressure from, from uh, Nasser, wanted to negotiate a treaty with Britain. They were having problems in Cyprus, and there were grave questions whether they would be able to actually use their, their bases there. So only Malta was left in the Mediterranean. We can't afford to lose more. And suddenly the, the, the defense departments were arguing in the British cabinet, we can't afford uh, independence. On the other hand, uh, Duncan Sands was saying, but just a moment, we've promised independence now, we've passed that stage, we can't go back on our word. So what do we do? I thought the answer says, uh, Duncan said, we'll make sure the referendum gives an inconclusive result. And that way, we can say, we need to postpone independence because the Maltese don't want it. And how did he plan to do this? You look at the last paragraph there. Sense, sensatorium P would not, ostensibly on holiday in Malta, to 
to go around the leaders of the centre parties to convince them that they should urge their followers not to abstain from the referendum, but to go in and actually put a blank vote. So that he would then be able to count the blank votes and say these are legitimate votes. If you don't go, you have no say. You've abstained from taking a decision. If you went there but put in a blank vote, he's going to say, ah, you went there but show that you don't want this. Uh, would not even go to the Godzi, uh, saying, you don't want to know. This it's not in the interest of the church. Push these three leaders to come out with, with that. It only works partially with Ganado. Ganado's party uh, advocates either a blank vote or a spoiled vote. The others say well, boy vote. The result of the referendum. Registered votes, voters notified the chair, but notice the yes votes. Because a lot of people say this was not this was not a decisive vote. The yes vote, 120,633 said yes, 54.47 of valid votes. 50.68 of votes cast. 41.9 of those entitled to vote. Now contrast that with the no vote, and you will see that the yes wins every time. And in fact, when they, when they meet in cabinet, British cabinet, after the result, uh, and after Sands has taken advice from Wakefield, the British commissioner in Malta, because he said, I'm going to say it's inconclusive, and Wakefield said, don't do that. You will be throwing a stone on your own foot if you do that. It's a mistake. You can't interpret it that way. And Sands is forced to go to cabinet and say, we have to accept the result of the referendum. Now, the Constitution and the Church's rights. Through the intervention of the Vatican, the constitutional position of the Church became acceptable to Her Majesty's government. The problem was this. The government was saying, the British government was saying, we can't have those two. Uh, amendments put in by Bocciolivier because the House of Commons will not pass the Malta uh, Independence Bill. They simply will refuse to do that. Right? But these two, but the Vatican said, you can remove those two clauses which the Church doesn't need one. Now, Bocciolivier was very angry. First of all, he didn't know that they had approached the Vatican. Now it is back. He didn't know about Monsignor Cardinale. And when he got to know that, he confronted him very, very strongly and, uh, and told him that it was an insult that he had interfered with our first approaching the Maltese government. But then he calmed down and he accepted what the Vatican said. Because at first he told, well, Gonzi would accept it. But Gonzi told the Vatican line immediately. But it removed part of what Bolshevik had hoped would be bargaining power with the, the British government. But they still find something else later, as we shall see, and that is the corrupt practice. Mm -hmm. Ah, what age does the <laughs> The corrupt practices act, as we shall see. The financial agreement. Here the two sides started quite far apart. What should they want? The ten year commitment. The British were only prepared to give a commitment of one to three years. There was also a chasm between the 57 million <coughs> demanded by Canada and the 8 million initially offered by Britain. HMG increased its offer to 40 million, but with a tie up between the financial and defense agreement. As long as the two go together, tied together, then we'll go as far as 40 million. Portugal refused the link and handed and held out for 40 million plus as we shall see. In fact, he, he got 50 million, he got an extra uh, million for restoration of monuments. The dockyard was passed uh, totally to, into the control of the British government and the British uh, also agreed to continue to finance the uh, conversion from a naval dockyard to an industrial
This, uh, the defense agreement, this was a much greater challenge for on its completion depended Malta's readiness, Britain's readiness to grant independence to Malta. Without this, there was no chance Britain was ready to concede independence. For Chalibis, the threat to design was taken so seriously that an alternative constitution was prepared in order to install a colonial administration. Parallel with the, with the negotiations for the defense agreement, the British government prepares a constitution ready made so that if Portugal really resigns, as he was threatening he would do, they would immediately suspend the constitution, put in the new one, and Malta would revert to colonial government again. You will, I hope, see what I mean that it was a just and done thing in the balance of this. When the question was put in cabinet whether it was worth having a defense agreement, if bit of my break it when it came to power because uh, some cabinet members said, now, why are we putting all this stress on the defense agreement? Sooner or later, there'll be a change of government in the middle of his power. He'll break it. He's been saying that, and he'll do it. Uh, notice uh, Douglas, uh, Douglas Hume, the Prime Minister's reply. Better to keep more children in power than the defense agreement, even though Mintoff may break it if he comes into power, when we might have to act by force to keep Ireland. Now, this is a really shocking statement. It's so shocking, it's, it is not recorded in the official cabinet minutes. I found this in another series of cabinet records, uh, kept by the cabinet secretary. These are shorthand notes of what each cabinet minister is saying. But of course, when you get the final version, you have, this was discussed and these were the arguments put forward and so on. But here, in that series of, of documents, uh, you find what each cabinet minister said. And this is what the prime minister said. The bone of contention was the UK insistence on a free hand concerning storage of nuclear weapons. What Olivier was adamantly against, and in July 1964, the British cabinet was discussing the withholding of independence. At a meeting at Chequers, Douglas Hume assured Bort Olivier that apart from temporary storage in transit, HMG had no intention to use Malta as the nuclear base, but Bort Olivier appeared unconvinced. Now, the British were not being untruthful here. It is clear from their own records that they, there might arise the chance that they need to store <coughs> some nuclear weapons in transit. They had no, no plans to have nuclear weapons in Malta. Borsolivi was saying, well, then say it. Say it in public. But the British couldn't say it because the United States government was saying, no, we can't say that because we can never admit that we have uh, nuclear powers, uh, weapons anywhere. Neither can we, can we show which particular ships are actually carrying nuclear weapons. So under pressure from the American government, the British government could not actually say that. HMG was still insisting on changing also the Maltese electoral law, claiming that unless they did so, you know, unless the Corrupt Practices Act was put in, they would be unable to pass the Malta Independence Bill through Parliament. What should be said? No chance. A Maltese law will only be, be changed or amended by a Maltese Parliament, not by the British government. That's unacceptable. But <coughs> faced with either not having the defense agreement and therefore not independence, what should be then loses his bargaining chip? He says, okay, I will sign the defense agreement if you agree not to change the electoral law. He didn't want the electoral law changed. The Labour Party did, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, Portugal didn't. This was agreed. And that was, that was, or appeared to be the last element. Actually, there was another one. Because the British government was under great strain from the Anglican Church to put in a much wider uh, clause in, in case of 
um, the, the need might arise for protecting Anglican rights in Malta. They said Anglican rights in other churches, but they were thinking obviously of Anglican rights. The, anyway, the deal was done. It's interesting that Mintoff had been uh, putting all his cards on the fact that the Labour Party in Britain was saying we will not, we will not uh, agree to the, to, the, to the Independence Bill unless the Corrupt Practices Act comes in. What happens here is the Prime Minister contacts the leader of the opposition, Wilson, tells him we can't have the defence agreement without, unless we give him on this. Wilson has an emergency meeting of his own executive, which goes on until midnight, but they decide, okay, we'll play ball. And they drop Bintoff, just like that. Now, I'm not saying this to show that Bintoff had the wrong ideas. I'm using this to illustrate another point. Most uh, politicians in Malta, when in opposition, when we were a colony, would contact members of the opposition to present their case in, in Britain. And this would be done in Parliament, uh, there would be statements, uh, questions, and so on. And we say, ah, they're defending our case. They will defend our case always, unless British interest is involved. That's the important thing. Sorry, I need to go back. On his return to Malta, uh, Bolshevik declared that it was the best deal in the circumstances. This is what he always said. He didn't say, this is the best deal you could get. The best deal in the circumstances. And here again, the difference between Mintov and Bolshevik. One day in Parliament, uh, Bolshevik, when Mintov was insisting, this is in the 50s, when Mintov was insisting that something could be done much better, he said, Domingue, el medio, el nemico del bene. If you try too hard to get the best, you can end up with getting an even worse deal. So get the best you can in the circumstances. This was his philosophy. Gonzalez declared that the church was satisfied with the constitution and as a gesture of goodwill lifted a new interdict from the members of the Malta Labour Party Executive Council that came on Independence Day. Mintoff labeled Malta's independence as a sham and vowed to replicate the agreements reached with the UK once he attained power. <coughs> uh, I'll practically end with what my assessment of Mintoff's position on this. It's up to you to agree with this. Mintoff could not stomach Porto Rivet's political triumph in achieving the island sovereignty. He had the choice of acknowledging the historic event without renouncing his right to criticize the, polit the political accords. In the process, <coughs> he would have his and his party's significant role in molding the national psyche in accepting that colonial dependence was stultifying and had to be thrown off. He went on instead to create his own historical narrative of Malta's emergence from its colonial York in an attempt to erase Malta's independence from the national memory through crude methods of denial and denigration that institutionalize national division, the consequences of which can still be felt today. And I stand by the judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that uh, it was a great mistake on his part. Thank you. Thank you very much for your extremely erudite exposition and I would now like to invite questions from the floor. Go from the chair. <laughs> John. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the divergence between Gonzi and Fatsch at a certain point. Yes. Uh, could you go a little bit further? Okay. That was one divergence. There were other divergences. And um, there was a great question about confessors telling Labour Party supporters that if they, if they voted Labour, they would uh, commit a mortal sin. Bo uh, 
Gonzi had been advised very strongly by the government that this would nullify the election. So he approached Monsignor Pace and uh, told him about it. Monsignor Pace listened very care carefully and politely and ignored him. Uh, again, in the case of Interdike, uh, Monsignor Gonzi only interdicted the members of the executive of the Labour Party, which had approved the party policy statement in 1961. Uh, in Gozo, there were different individuals who were interdicted. Uh, some of them simply because they were members of the Malta Labour Party. Again, Gonzi protested about this. Again, Pasha would not listen to him. And in fact, he was, Gonzi was very angry in one exchange with the governor. He, he told him, there's nothing I can do with this man. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Andrew? Sure. If I don't get absolution because I confess a sin, I can understand. I'm not, I'm not bishop. Yes, that's fair. You used to condemn me quite often back in the day. What would make me confess to the sin of, of voting Labour? If it's not a. No, because according to, say, to say, yeah, according to say, circular sin. Confessors were specifically to ask each confessor ah, okay. whether they had voted Labour. If they had voted Labour, they would then ask them whether they were uh, contrite about their action and whether they intended to repeat it in the future. If they were contrite and promised not to repeat it, then they got absolution. Otherwise, they didn't. That would be such an interesting question in 1996 and 2013. <laughs> Not to say 2017. Before you can ask that question in 2019, you will need people to come to confess. <laughs> if I may ask a question, um, you mentioned that you said that um, the incidents of 28 April 1958 were mm -hmm. Mendoza's greatest miscalculation. Uh, would you subscribe to the view that the imposition of mortars in was also a great miscalculation. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. It was uh, Gonzi miscalculated, and, and the church and those around him miscalculated. They did not look at history and learn from it. Uh, for many years, the church went under the uh, impression, mistaken impression, that during the first political religious court, Strickland had been beaten by the church. That Strickland had been, his party at that stage had been destroyed by the church. This is not true. Look at the results of the 1932 election, when supposedly uh, Strickland vote, Strickland's vote disappeared. Look at that, at those results. What will you find? You'll find that Strickland's personal vote increased. His party's vote increased. So the legitimate question, then how come the Nationalists elected 21 out of 32 members? Very simply, what the church managed to do in 1932 was bring down the vote. If you look at the percentage of those who voted in 1932 and those who voted in 1930, you will, be a, you will find a significant rise in the number of voters. But the, the church misinterpreted that. It thought it had destroyed uh, the foundations of Strickland and his party. It hadn't. That's a, Strickland supporters told the church in no uncertain way, don't interfere. This is our political choice. In 1956, on the eve of the integration referendum, referendum Gonzi goes on redistribution and tells everybody to vote no. Right? Look at the results. 44% of the electorate ignored him. 44% Manta Catolicissima. Right? Telling him it's none of your business. Again, he said it was a triumph. Come 1962, they go to the limit. Once they've interacted the party, once they've put those mutuals in, there's nothing else they could do. The only thing left to them that they could do is take a step back, which they didn't want to do, because they would lose face. Right? And 
great movement of stands. So they were caught in their own trap. It was a massive mistake. Hmm. I was going to ask our professor about a very intense to publish another volume uh, beyond 1964. Uh, would you like to be responsible for my divorce? <laughs> would you like to be responsible for my divorce? I mean, uh, ask my uh, agent over there. <laughs> yes. In that case, I would suggest that there should be two volumes. <laughs> because it's a stool to think. No, uh, uh, no that, that vo I have no choice with that volume, and I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the four volumes, you will find that they have the same structure. You have a middle section, which is social and economic, not pure politics. Okay? Now, if you look at the last volume, try to put a break between two. And you find you can't do that without making it artificial. If you come up to the volume which is just economic and social, people will be disappointed. You've got to keep... So, I knew it was too long, I cut it back as far as I could, but on the other hand, I had also to look at other constraints, and that is, I didn't want to open myself to any accusation that I left anybody's point of view out. I think I put everybody's point of view there, and treated it as fairly as I could. No, I, I accept that. That's the answer. About, to, to come back to your original question, about what comes afterwards, I published two volumes, the story of the Tamata, the spont, sorry, the story of the Constitution Tamata, the spont politician, or something like that. Sorry, the spont story. And uh, the second volume goes from 1943 to 2004, and that's fairly deep. Are there any more questions? But I will ask one final question. The, these developments, these which, developments, which we have been talking about, uh -huh. leading to what is independence, <coughs> you made reference in your talk um, to what I'm going to say. But how can you perhaps um, delve a bit more into how much these developments were conditioned by what was happening in the outside world, the Cold War? The Berlin blockade, <coughs> Cuba. Malta was not the the, the, the the advance of communism. Malta was not and is not an exception. So the whole uh, what was going on in the outside world quite obviously impinged on what was happening here. Uh, it impinged, uh, if you look, for example, about Britain's need of the defence agreement. One one thing, the fear that Malta communism would come into Malta and Malta would become a Cuba the Mediterranean. Another, another example. And then again, you know, you, one can simply say, you know, uh, turn up your nose and say, well, well, this is just a lot of fears, needless fears. But you have to give, you have to give Gonzi his uh, his fair due, in the sense that he really believed what he was saying. If you, I, I see some of his private. Uh, correspondence with uh, members of the Vatican hierarchy, uh, where he, for example, is telling them the problem is that Newton is trying to uh, make it easier for communism to settle more. He believes this. He's not making it up. You know, uh, it, it, it's a constant. It's a constant trait. He says this man is an apostate. He has. Uh, given up going to church, he thinks that uh, you know the church is simply full of corpus, etc. And he's trying to sweep everything away. This is doing a lot of harm to our society. Uh, this is what he, what he's saying and, and he really believes it. Uh, so it's not you know these are private uh, letters. He doesn't have to put on an act. Uh, his mistake was that he trusted the British. He trusted the British over much. And he had also another weakness. He talked too much <coughs> with British officials. You know, this is like, for example, uh, telling the, the Prime Minister Macmillan, he had said this in 49 already to the government secretary. He said, 
it's better for Malta not to have a Maltese government as long as Mintov is not Prime Minister. He thinks these are private conversations. Ten days after he says this to Macmillan, Mintov is holding a meeting in Malta and saying, I have been told, and I don't believe this, I don't believe this, that the Archbishop told the, the Prime Minister that no. Now, I don't, I don't believe, but I would like Archbishop Gonzi to make a statement uh, saying that it is not true. And he's got Gonzi in a bind. Gonzi can't come out and say, I didn't say it. Right? Because he did say it. And Mintov got his, got his information from Harold Wilson. Because what the Maltese did not understand was this. That both sides of the House of Commons, government and opposition, were in constant dialogue. You know, the only time you find the two sides in modern times, the, the two sides of the House opposed to each other, when there is, for example, a war, is over suits. Otherwise, they're going to hold together. The Colonial policy, they're going to hold together. So what they do is, all the time, is the Secretary of State is constantly briefing his opposite number. Okay? Because he knows he might need his cooperation in the future. And that way he can get it. So, anything you said was not going to remain to enforce wars. Very well, thank you very much yeah. for your presentation.